All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Brady Maiden, and I am the Community Science Program Manager here for the Seven Aids Coalition. I am joined here today with an amazing group of women as we sit down and celebrate National Women and Girls HIV Awareness Day. So today we are shining a spotlight on women and girls and the need for their representation in HIV vaccine research and so many other spaces. Together with our partner organizations from the Vanderbilt Vaccine Program and our guests from Meharry Medical College and the Human Rights Campaign, and also with the collaborative support from the HIV Vaccine Trials Network, we're excited to dive into a conversation around sexual health knowledge, vaccine research, and the efforts that really help to center women and girls of all experiences in the movement. And with that, I would like to open it up for all of our guests and my co-moderator, Jarissa, to introduce themselves. Thank you so much, Brady. Um, I am excited to be here and just want to go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Jarista Grenard. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the community educator and recruiter for the Vanderbilt HIV vaccine program. Yes. Thanks. Who wants to go next? Thank you, Jarissa. Alberta, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, my name is Alberta Hollison. I am the chair for the Community Advisory Board for the Vanderbilt uh, HIV Vaccine Program, and I'm also a uh, National Pride uh, Grand Marshal for 2022. Right. <laughs> well, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Carmarian D. Anderson hyphen Harvey. Uh, my required pronouns is she, her, and hers. I serve as the Alabama State Director with the National Office of the Human Rights Campaign. Um, in addition to that, I actually serve as the UAB, which is in Birmingham, Alabama hospital system. I serve as their chair of their community advisory board for HIV vaccination and many of the lashes that I wear. And I hope that um, you will enjoy the conversation that we'll be having today. Well, I guess that leaves me. I'm Leah Alexander. I work at Meharry Medical College. I'm the chair of public health practice and the director of our master's um, of public health program. People know Meharry for the medical school and the dental school, but there is a graduate school with a mighty but strong MPH program. And just to tie up some of this connection already, I did my graduate work at UAB. So I know all about Birmingham. <laughs> I'm only five, I'm almost close five years in, you know. I still wear my Texas, my Texas hair, okay? <laughs> oh, I love that Texas in the house. I'm from Arlington. So Okay, Garland. So yeah, so yeah, so yeah. So I'm deep southern, deep southern. And and I think that's what's gonna come out in our conversation on today. Um, just because where the data is as it relates to women and girls. Yes. And so you know, um, so thank y'all for sharing that. So I feel like I'm right at home. Yes, yes. yes. Perfect. Nothing like Southern hospitality. I mm. mean, grease and butter at the same time. Did you hear me? <laughs> so <laughs> good. <laughs> Well, now that we're all acquainted, I would love to just jump right on in with a short um, icebreaker. And I was wondering if I could, and I'm opening up with one question about if everyone could share a positive story um, around HIV and Awareness Day, um, whether it be an encounter or, um, or a personal experience, really want to start this conversation with uh, really stripping away any shame, stigma, and discrimination, and, and oftentimes just lift positive experiences around um, HIV and Awareness Day. So I'm opening up the floor for anyone to start, although I'm happy to jump in <laughs> if you'd like me to. Well, I can start. So I, mean, I work at Meharry. I feel like I've been here forever, but probably started in 2008, but shortly after I got here, um, I started working on Project Saved, which was a CDC funded sort of capacity, HIV capacity building grant for African-American churches. And so was, you know, thrilled to, to join that team. The person who wrote that grant, she since passed away, but her name is Jacqueline Fleming Hampton, um, was kind of, you know, legendary, if you could say that, in the, the field of like, trying to, to talk about HIV in faith-based spaces. And mm -hmm. so after she passed, we wanted to, you know, just always recognize her every year. So we um, just, you know, finished our 13th, it might be 14th, because we may have messed the numbers up. So it's either the 13th or the 14th um, 
commemoration of what we call our Jacqueline Filming Hampton Day, but it also coincides with MBAD, so National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day. So like 13 years, that's nothing to balk at, that we have gathered and we kind of party a little bit. We have a little bit of a family reunion. We throw some art in there because it's Black folks and we're creative. Um, and we hear about research. And so if I you know, think about one of the things that I'm most proud of sort of establishing here at Meharry and sustaining here at Meharry is um, you know, our activities around National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day. So yeah, I think I'll go next because you you mentioned about Black church. I'm going to give two stories um, just because I think it's relevant for the conversation. I think the first, um, I was excited many years ago um, before we start celebrating um, HIV awareness uh, for our transgender population, particularly trans women, we were included uh, with women and girls. And let me just tell you, there were some that got it wrong. Mm. And there was some that got it right. And the ones that got it right is because they invited my community to sit at the table of planning and really um, um, build it out as it relates to how do we use respectful language around HIV awareness. Um, and I was um, in Austin, Texas, uh, working in the field. Um, and I want to say that they got it right um, when, you know, we start um, ensuring that the diversity or the di diaspora of women um, was included. And so that's one story. So I'll lift Austin, Texas up. Um, and I would like to say there are other cities since I've been around uh, for quite some time now that really is ensuring um, that we're moving away maybe from the binary um, and really looking at this from a non-binary um, aspect because we have to include certain elements of gender and sexual orientation as it relates to the public health data of reducing HIV. I think the other piece is, is that uh, about 20 years ago, I embarked, became a clergy person um, under Bishop um, Yvette Flunder, a wonderful name in public health um, as it relates to Black church. Um, and I remember her being in the pulpit. For those that may not know Bishop Flunder, she's also the senior pastor, City of Refuge in San Francisco. Um, and she has a nonprofit, Y Flunder Foundation, Foundation, and one of her objectives in ministry is HIV, how many people she has like set with. So getting into the field while also serving in ministry with her, there was one scripture and we as clergy persons try to contextualize scripture to the best of our ability. But I heard this little woman, let me just tell you, who uh, was talking about HIV and she automatically said, because the scripture says the sickness is not unto death. And she went like this. <laughs> and when I tell you that woke something up in my spirit, because that was also awareness, it wasn't an awareness day, but it was the first time that I heard in my black church experience, my Pentecostal background, that we were talking about HIV that's transmitted, you know, we know it's numerous ways, but most don't speak about it because of the, the because it involves sex. Nobody wants to talk about Jesus and sex, Okay. And so that blessed me uh, over 20 years ago when she just made that scriptural um, statement that this sickness is not unto death. Um, mm -hmm. and to me, that woke up something on how we are able to bridge together our faith and as well as HIV, among other things that we choose not to speak about because it's relevant and it's happening. Woo, that is a word I'm about to show right now. <laughs> Um, that I loved what you were saying about raising awareness and kind of something that came to my mind is a, a World AIDS Day event that happened last year where uh, someone was sharing their lived experience with HIV and something that they said was very profound in terms of, you know, it's important to have um, the statistics and the data to look at um, that really informs us where we need to go, where, where the gaps are and how we need to start feeling them. And also they were saying that it's also important to bring the humanity piece back in HIV. Um, sometimes uh, it seems like that portion is getting lost. And so it really started to have this, I really started having this internal dialogue of how can I make HIV more personal? How can I make it more approachable? How can I, you know, play a role in helping to stop stigma and discrimination around HIV? And so I think 
faith is going to play a big role in that. I think, you know, re, uh, trying to imagine where are the community, not even trying to imagine, but trying to identify where the community barriers are and getting really creative around trying to address those things. It's not just HIV, it's HIV and all of us. And so how can we tackle this together as a community? Oh, so good. <laughs> Oh, yes, Drosa. Um, honestly, like you took the words right out of my mouth, like centering human in HIV is honestly why I show up to work every day, why I'm in these spaces, because we have to continue to find ways to meet folks where they're at and connect with them. And I've been, um, I think last year at a DC Black Pride event, it was just like dancing with folks, like being in community, taking shots, like, yeah, we, you know, like there's something about the kid that makes you want to celebrate, but like, having that space to really meet people, you know what I mean? Outside of like having to assign labels, having to um, worry about the fact that we're constantly talking about the negative, we're constantly talking about the barriers, we're constantly talking about how the world perceives folks who work in HIV and the community that we serve. But just being able to bond, connect was just, it was spiritual, it was moving. It just reminds me and centers me like why we continue to need to have these conversations. So yes. Well, um, I was at, uh, Nashville has a Black Pride event. Uh, it's actually a, a national event, uh, Black Pride. And this was several years ago. And I think it was, uh, we it was 505, um, which was a very, very large, uh, massive trial that we were having. And we were trying to get more Black people, more Black gay people uh, to be involved. So actually someone came from uh, Seattle down to Nashville for Black Pride just to speak. So the CEO at the time was a white guy. So he was like, this is not appropriate for me to speak about this. So it was a Black guy, but everybody was there was looking and pretty much I could just see in their eyes and you know, you're black, so you you know you can read the room. And they were like, they just brought this black guy down here to say something to us. And I was just sitting to the side and I'm seeing this. He done the guy had done his bill and everything. And I was like, I made a comment and I was like, I see what y'all what y'all I know what y'all thinking. And I don't remember what I said. I went to that space, wherever it was, it came out very profound. Uh, but end up I, but I told about my history. I told about my lived experience. I understood where they were, how I understood about research and how Black people don't you know, want to be in research. And I was trying to tell them why we need to be in research. And whatever I said was uh, profound enough that I ended up changing everyone's mind in mm -hmm. that room. And to me, it, it just brought back that, you know, sometimes... As y'all was saying, living your truth and speaking your truth, it can change people. It can change people's mind. So sometimes you have to verbalize and be vulnerable in order mm -hmm. to live the truth mm -hmm. in order to change people. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, living in our truth and like speaking our truth is definitely, I would say, huge, a huge component into the work that we do. And just to remind us to center ourselves. And as we know, we need to center our center ourselves because with the positive, with the joy, with coming, with the, I would say, balance of living in your truth, there's also going to be some BS. You're also going to have to navigate other people's thoughts, other people's opinions, and how to challenge those stereotypes as you're continuing to live your authentic self in the movement. And so I would say for you all, um, with the joy, but also that balance of the BS that I was talking about, what are some of the like key misconceptions about HIV and AIDS among women and girls that really need to be addressed in order for us to move forward? I mean, something that comes to mind for me is that we're not a population that has to be concerned or we're not a priority pop population. And I, I, I challenge people on that because there, because then I start to question or get curious about, well, why do you think that, you know, the uh, HIV and women and girls are, there's no connection or there, there's no, nothing to be hesitant or concerned about. And I think it's because people think that there's a certain look to HIV. I think that um, people think that it's only a, um, a men who have sex with men um, issue. And we really end up 
leaving women and girls out of the conversation. Um, and also challenging the fact, well, you know, you don't look like someone who could be quote unquote at risk or someone who would be deemed to be a vulnerable population. And so we really have to challenge, like we really have to start challenging these narratives of uh, HIV doesn't discriminate. There are certain practices that can put you at, um, at, at a great risk of vulnerability. And so we need to be more intentional about having um, these candid conversations around amongst community members. And you really need to start with education. And it's important to start where someone, um, important to meet people where they are, as, as we were discussing earlier. Um, I think Berta beautifully portrayed an example of, you know, if someone doesn't have a relationship with you, the, the willingness to engage in that conversation is kind of, um, there's going to be some hesitation. You have to build trust too. And so those are some things that I think that are barriers that we need to think about overcoming together and concerns with women and girls. We have to build trust. We have to be able to meet people where they are. We have to lead with education and understanding. I think to add to that, I mean, I agree with all of that. Um, I think we also need to look for ways to kind of, you know, establish our, you know, wise auntie, our rich auntie kind of giving some advice. Uh, because in the, you know, the work that I do, sometimes I, you know, I'm like, gosh, knowledge, HIV knowledge still isn't where it needs to be. Like you would think we, you know, people would really know and they don't. So then we need those relationships where we can have these conversations. And for women and girls, it's usually mothers, daughters, but sometimes when it's sex, you know, mamas and daughters talking about sex can be stressful. So you need that, you know, network of aunties that are there to talk with girls, women and girls, young women and girls in particular, you know, take the blinders off and like, let's have a real conversation. So, so girls are equipped with knowledge to just protect themselves. You know, I don't, I want you to do you, be you, have fun, but you have to, you know, protect yourself. So. I, and I was going to um, kind of piggyback as well. I think um, for me, I can answer this in two ways. I think the first is, is for us that are women of diaspora, such as our trans identified community, um, one of the misconception is, is that because I choose to live out my truth, I am automatically going to contract HIV. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a misconception mm -hmm. um, as they're uh, are equating that my gender or my, my gender purpose um, is going to harm me in such a way that I won't make the decision to protect myself sexually. Um, and we understand where the data is and it's not because we are not protecting ourselves it's because we have systems that are truly working to discriminate the most marginalized. And so how am I to pay my light bill? Mm. How am I supposed to get bread and have a PBJ sandwich? You know, so those are misconceptions. And so having a the, the, the real conversation on social determinants of health, yeah. as I like to say, is the social determinants of reality. Mm -hmm. The conversation to meet the community where they're at Data is important, but also lived experiences, also community, people's first language. The other piece, when I think about women's and girls, and I'm going to take this more from a binary, for many of years, we have been taught as women that we are less of, yeah. that we're only good for certain things, domestic things, uh, baby carrying and pushing out. Uh, you, you understand, I think you understand what I'm saying. And then when we have in the South, um, and I can imagine other places, but then when we mix in our faith religion, then we are to keep silent. Yeah, We have no place, you know, um, if we raise our voice, we're being disrespectful to the order uh, of hyper-masculine that we cannot call out. And so it never gave us a position to have a voice to advocate. When, when AIDS came in years ago, there were women that were just as effective as those that were men who sleep with men, as well as same gender loving men. Those are two different things. You have some that are out and you have some that choose not to be out. We used to call them DLs back in the day. And those DLs that were back in the day, because this is my story, is it said, I know what they wanted mm. and gave them what they wanted mm. and put myself at risk and them, and then, then they go, and then they go to, you know, Brady 
not saying what their mm -hmm. truth is or who they've been with. Do you understand? So we've been taught to keep somewhat silent. We see yeah. that even as strong professional women in leadership, mm -hmm. we still get paid the lowest. They want our vo uh, voices silent. So with that mentality, what makes you think that we can heal some of the misconceptions that are lies? Mm -hmm. uh, and how do we increase our voice to tell our own truth and our own narrative? And those that are with the money, I see, I, I'm all, I'm here now, okay? Those <laughs> with the money, you know, I'm here now. Those with the money will take our stories so the money will be allocated appropriately. Mm. Appropriately. I am, and I'll say the last thing. Last year at the United States Conference on HIV and AIDS, USCAH, I'm part of the United States HIV AIDS Faith Coalition. I had the honor um, to give the homily for our, um, our institute uh, for faith leaders. One of the things that I mentioned, it was probably one of the hardest sermons I had to create because it was taking my trans theology and move it into a woman's theology, uh, which I think I did great because there really is no difference when we're both are uh, communities that are very much the same, but, but discriminated, you understand? Yeah. And I remember from a Christian text, even 2000 years ago in the book of Matthew, when Matthew uh, wrote about the boy and the two fish mm -hmm. and um, gave credit to a young man, really didn't say thank you, just give me your two sardines and a piece of cracker. It was multiplied and everybody ate, but did no one consider when Matthew gave the epidemiology data that he left out women in the data. Mm -hmm. And if it had not been for that woman who got up early in the morning and went fishing to pack her son a lunch for the journey to go see someone who can heal and deliver and set free. I'm, I'm Pentecostal. Okay. That's, that's what I am. Okay. <laughs> to go see someone, then there will never been a fish available. And yes. we never gave the woman the credit and we left her out of the data. And, and 2000 years now, we are still seeing where we are being left out of the data mm -hmm. and the conversation of just being women. And how do you leave someone out when we're the ones that birth everything in the earth? Mm -hmm. I'm including even my trans identified women, whether that's by womb or whether that's by vision, you understand what I'm saying. I'm linking yeah. those together and you leave us out. And if we die, who is going to multiply the earth in truth? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's true. I yield my time. Well, my main thing that I've seen and that I've tried to do is I see a lot of uh, generational curses, uh, a lot of stuff as in, you know, people are like, they don't, when you were saying have that person to talk to, they don't have that person to talk to. So I'll, I'll try to be that person to talk to, but I also give them the information. There's different places that you can go. If I'm not available, there's places that you can go. There's ways that you can do stuff, you know, and you do not have to live that previous life. You know, you sit there and you talk about how you don't like how this part of, you know, this or that part. Okay, then don't live that way. You know, you don't have to do the same thing as your parents, as your grandparents. There's different ways to live now, but you can still live a Christian life, but you don't have to be the person who's in the church every single solitary Sunday. You know, one of, um, and I'm going to say this wrong, so you can correct me, but you know, I know one of the things of scripture that, you know, if there's two among, uh, if there's two of Two people together yeah, that I shall be. I know I'm saying that more. one, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's something like that. But I'm like, yeah, you can have your spiritual, your spirituality in multiple ways, you know, and you can find God in multiple ways. But also, you can find your truth and how you want to live in a different way. You don't mm -hmm. have to live like everybody else. And I also tell people because it's not easy, but not living your truth is harder than, you know doing all this stuff just because this is what mama did, this is what grandmama did, this is what society says I should do. Living your truth is way easier than not. 
Mm. Alberta, can I just add something just real quick and I'll yield my time again? Is this that when we <laughs> speak about generational curse, which I know that usually is a religious term, but we need to start speaking about uh, recycling cultural curses, okay? Mm. Uh, and the reason why I say that is, is that there are women now that were taught by their mothers and grandmothers to keep silent in order to keep their man. Yeah, I have. Listen, I don't mind telling my truth there. You know, I'm going through a divorce, but I've worn plenty of rings. I only got married one time, though. OK, um, but what I remember in my first engagement um, well over a decade ago and we moved in together, which, you know, they didn't have a problem with with that. They had, a, you know, they had a problem among other things. But that's a whole nother story. And I remember my my mother was my mentor and my best friend. Um, I have almost thirty years, you know, in my uh, gender purpose. Okay, so I was a teen, I was a parent, and now I'm a grandmother of three. So this is like over a decade ago. I was talking to her on the phone, and um, because I was, you know, kind of a homemaker. You know, I didn't have to work. You know, he made good money. Um, so I watched soap operas during the day. My mom, mother worked at home. And um, days of our lives, let me just tell y'all, okay? <laughs> as the world turns, my, my, my. Yeah. Okay, as the world turns. Mm -hmm. And so um, my mother would call, we would have phone calls. It went like this in the morning. The phone would ring. Me, hey, child. Mother, hey, child, what are you doing? And we would just talk about stuff in the evening time, around four, the same conversation. But she always asked me, has my son-in-law got home? I was like, no, he's due about 30 minutes from now. She started quizzing me. Well, what's for dinner? She said, did you did you clean the house? I said, oh, mother, I did that before I start watching the soap operas, which in my time zone, Days of Our Lives came up at 1 p.m. And she said, oh, no, no, you got to pull that Hoover out. A man like to see lines when they walk in the house. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Yeah. I'm giving you this story in my testimony because that is a cultural curse mm -hmm. because we was made to keep silent in order to keep something or if you don't give it, they'll go out somewhere else and get it and it's your fault. Mm -hmm. So we have been structured culturally, no matter what race you are, no matter what region you are, that was the, that was the time that we were taught and many of us probably should have been out of relationships, but we kept our mouth closed because that's what we was taught. And then when we came out of it, we also know that we came out with the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come on, we can be real about it. We, we come out because yep. of silence, because that's how society told us that we had to be. And for our women and our girls, where they've already taken sex education out of school, don't even want to talk about how to protect themselves. Churches are really not doing that. Where are the community centers that they're not teaching it at Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts? Okay, Troop 100 here, okay? I don't mind telling my... They're not doing that. And so there is a responsibility, like Dr. Alexandra just said, about where are those aunties, where, where are those um, individuals that are our elders in the community to say, sit your hips down, let me tell you a story, let me tell you my testimony. Yeah. 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 That's so good because I really appreciate what you had to say about breaking those cultural um, curses. Yeah. curses. Because something that comes up for me and, and just sharing my story, being a queer black woman of color who is poly, that is who came from a Baptist background, that is not something that, <laughs> and that's something still today that I'm still navigating. You're and, a concubine, and, honey, in Old Testament, you're a concubine. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the saints, the saints is like, say what? <laughs> what's in their pearls, right? And, but I lived, I lived in a time that I had to be silent, or I lived in a time where I was expected to wear this mask and, and pretend and perform mm -hmm. and and, and be like, I'm okay when I know that there are some unsettling things happening because I'm not being my true authentic self. Yeah. And so we do have to get in the habit of breaking those, those curses and, 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 and raising our voices. The time to be silent is over. And that really helps kind of guide into the next question. Cause we already know that silence isn't working. Silence mm -hmm. is not going to get us closer to the change. Silence mm -hmm. is not going to get us closer to ending this epidemic. So I really want to ask the questions to the group is how can we come back stigma and discrimination associated with HIV and AIDS, um, especially when it comes to women and girls, because those girls are, whether we know it or not, those girls are looking to us to lead. They're looking to us for an example. And so what are we going to do about it? What's going to be our answer? What's going to be our response so that we can help move this community forward? You know, I'll say for me, 
it has really been people with lived experience with HIV and AIDS who were generous enough to share, you know, and, and brave enough to share their story. But, you know, I know that it's not fair to put all that pressure on them, you know, to be the ones to like open the conversation or start or, you know, share. Because even that, I would imagine for people with lived experience is a process to where you get, you know, to the point where you, you know, you want to share. But for me, um, learning, you know, people that sometimes you would have never even imagined, you know, have lived experience with HIV and AIDS has been so helpful because you kind of already know them outside of some of that other stuff. And so it kind of doesn't matter. I mean, you know, you may be like, oh my gosh, but I know you and I know that I know you. So it really doesn't matter. But how can I serve you? What can I do? You know, how can I be an ally, an advocate, you know, be helpful? For me, that is really, you know, what has been probably the most, you know, the most impactful. But I say it, you know, with the voice of it's not fair for that to be the only way that we kind of get around stigma is you, you know, hear from people. Um, one of the things that I, you know, I also think about, you know, being a, a woman of faith and, you know, having grown up in the church, you know, let, let us all just treat people better than we want to be treated. If we just start there, you know, regardless of what we think people have going on, but just make a commitment to treat people better than we want to be treated. If we could do that, a lot of these issues and these differences and all these problems, you know, would I think would fall away. Yeah. yeah. I am, um, Dr. Alexander, if you get me a scholarship, I'll take a class, I promise you, okay? <laughs> I'm asking on record, okay. <laughs> but listen, listen. So when we think about the word combat, you know, we, we, we have you know, combat means fighting. It can mean call out. You know, we need to make sure that we have a group of an army. I think the challenge of combating when it comes to our women and girls, um, we are scattered. Mm. And it's unfortunate. We are scattered by institutions. We're scattered because of data. We're scattered because of funding. Um, we are scattered because... Um, one woman with a lived experience don't think somebody who is, you know, who is um, high risk to it should be in the same circle. Listen, we're going to have to come together. I wear Maybelline. You may want to wear your Mary Kay. Listen, however you apply, I'm still going to say you beautiful. Okay. Yeah. And if we don't come uh, together, then we can't use the word and we can't make combat an actionable word. Mm -hmm. And for us to fight, for us to call that out, to dismantle the stigma and discrimination that is coming upon us. Well, there is also some accountability. So there's a circle of accountability. I can talk about my women community all day. I can give you your praises, but I also can call out when I see that you could have mm -hmm. done more, sis. And I will allow you to tell me what I could have done differently. You hear what I'm saying? It's like that extended grace. And we need to give yeah. that as women to each other. The other piece where the other accountability is, is those who have the funding to make our voices heard. Give us the mic. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, uh, MSM, I love y'all to, 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 to pieces, honey. Okay, I really do. I, I really do. But I, you know, I, I like a good heterosexual, you know, um, you know, but I love y'all. Y'all my good Judy's. Some of y'all are fine. Some of y'all, I've changed some of y'all minds. Okay, that's the Holy <laughs> Ghost speaking. Okay, but at the same time, they can't speak for the woman's narrative. Yeah. It's almost like reproductive health. As a Black woman of trans experience, I cannot speak about a wound. Mm -hmm. You got the wrong person in the community. You need to go get my trans masculine sibling mm -hmm. so they can advocate for where the message should go, who's been yeah. impacted. The commercials that we see, mm -hmm. I want to see Cersei, come on, um, my, my lovely pharmaceutical companies, I have to lower my voice because all of them love me, you understand, okay, and I love them right back. But I need to see us as women in commercials. We yes. need to, the mic. We need to be talking about successful antiretroviral medications mm -hmm. that we take on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. or a shot 
that we can take, you know, every two months, buy mm -hmm. medical. What does prep look for us? Give us the mic. So yeah. we can see ourselves representing in the masses of the media. And if we don't see that, then we're going to think that it's not for us. Mm -hmm. we're, got, we're not going to think there is a crisis for us. So we really going to come back. We got to start calling things that are sustainable mm -hmm. and yeah. not woe unto me and I'm the victim. Mm. Okay. Sustainable, which means that come with a plan of action. We are overcomers by our testimony. But listen, I don't know what woe unto me. Listen, we already live in hell on earth, okay? <laughs> I need something that's going to give me joy. So how do we Stop come listening. together, complement each other? Sis, I understand what you're going through if we're yeah. both diagnosed with HIV. Or I may not know what you're going through, but I'm certainly high risk and I'm your co-conspirator. Mm -hmm. And then we go charge the people who have the finances to make our voices heard. I want to start seeing us yeah. in commercials. Yeah. I want to start seeing us in the data. I want to start seeing us in recruiting efforts, okay? I want to start seeing that gynecologists don't have a problem talking about medication that will prevent us from uh, contracting HIV or for those that are, how are you incorporating that? There is so much more that we can do. We yeah. need to catch up with our MSM community where there is funding directly for them. And I'm not bashing. I am glad that the numbers are being reduced in the MSM community, but they certainly are going somewhere to being increased. Mm -hmm. And that obvious is going to be the women, the girls, the trans identified women. And heaven forbid, this is about women's and girls, but there are other priority and key populations that is in result of being absent from the media, from the finances. Yeah. That are not. So we got to come together as a great army. Combat means fight. And whatever that might look like, honey, Vaseline and do what you got to do. But we got to fight in order to make our voices heard because we are dying. We're yeah. dying, not just from HIV, but because of our voices, we're dying in other areas that's taking our choices away from us. I think what you said is so important, but we need to be combating the same thing instead of combating amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I think that's so powerful. Well, I'm a Reiki master. I don't know if y'all know what Reiki is, but yes. I'm a Reiki master. I've spoken tough. You somebody mm. did this to me one time. Had a migraine. <laughs> yes, I, I yes. <laughs> so one of the things that I'm always uh when I'm doing a session is I'm trying to have how people come back their own thoughts, their mm -hmm. own feelings about mm -hmm. themselves. You know, you're even if you become HIV positive, that's not the end of your life. You are not, you're the rest of your life may be slightly altered, but you are not, you should not have to be punished or, you know, you should not have to be drastically altered from this one decision that gave you this one particular mm -hmm. illness. You know, you can still live, you can still thrive, you can still do more. So a lot of times people just need to combat themselves, mm -hmm. uh, combat society, combat stigma. And a lot of people need to learn to be able to do that combating you know, having with them themselves to combat. And um, actually, I find, um, I actually had a comment when I was Grand Marshal, a friend of mine, he threw a party at his house and his sister is gay. And she was like, oh, well, my brother was telling me all the stuff that you do. She said, I'm glad your straight buzz out there. Uh, well, actually, she said, I'm glad your straight ass is out there <laughs> doing it because she said, I can't. I couldn't do that. She said, I'm not willing to do the margin. I'm not willing to do that. I'm just happy that somebody's out there. But, and I was like, I'm happy to be your representative. I'm happy to be your ally in this fight. If you can't do it, I am more than willing to be out there with the signs, to be out there, to be that. But that's a lot of stuff that I see. You have to combat what's within yourself mm -hmm. in order to go out there and to do stuff. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm. That is, oh, I feel like I'm taking on so much. <laughs> Everyone has beautiful. You know what, though? I want to kind of go back to something else we talked about because it, it kind of reminded me of, um, you know, experience that I'm having with my lovely daughter. And of course, I'm so thankful for both of my beautiful mm -hmm. children that I have been blessed with. But my mama says that my daughter is like me. And so I sure, I'm sure that she you know, is thinking that I'm getting my due diligence. But, you know, I've tried to raise both of my kids, really, but my daughter, you know, to have a voice, you know, as a young person. But then 
I'm to the point where I'm like, this girl with this voice is about to get on my damn nerves. So I'm like, you know, raised her to have a voice and I want her to be a woman, you know, that has a voice. But, you know, if we think about working with youth, we have to work with the parents so that mm -hmm. they have the wherewithal to commit to, okay, I'm going to try to raise these, you know, I'm going to use the right words for body parts. I mean, I, you know, talked about vaginas and penises really early with my children. I talked about where, where babies came from, but you know, then they get, get you, get you embarrassed in situations because they're, you know, talking about penises and vaginas in the wrong company or telling the kids where babies come from. My daughter, you know, told some, some kids from school and they're like, oh, my mama told me babies come from heaven, not from all this stuff that, you know, you're saying. So I think when we talk about working with youth, we also have to work with the parents so that we can have the wherewithal to commit to what it means to raise women, all children, but, you know, future women to have this voice because it is different to deal with when we have these cultural expectations and these gender roles of what is appropriate for, for how women should be. And we say, well, we want to do this, but it's hard to commit, you know, mm -hmm. to what it takes to, you know, start early on with teaching people how to advocate for themselves, teaching people how to have, you know, have a voice. It's hard. It's hard. So, I mean, I'm struggling with my daughter and I'm like, I know I raised you to have a voice, but you, it, <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. um, I think that we need to do that hand in hand with the parents, you know, who are, who are raising girls. You know, I say I'm raising revolutionaries, mm. you know, that are going to change the world. But like day to day, I am the mama and y'all can't tell me what to do. Y'all not going to beat me. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. So it's hard. It's hard to to be committed to that. I think a hundred percent. Can I just yeah. mention something real quick? I want the audience to really marinate on these tools that we are reciting. Okay, yeah. Doctor Alexander just wrote somebody's next grant. Come on, somebody. Yes. And I can't I? You know, I I can't promote organizations because we want to be nonpartisan right now in our conversation. We're talking about women and girls, but there's a few grants out right now. Deadlines are yes. approaching, yeah. okay? And um, Dr. <laughs> Alexander just gave you one good piece of a priority population of youth and parent. Come on, somebody. Yes. Yes. We're giving you tools here. And, you know, and I don't want people, the audience to miss that, that we're not just here having conversations. You know, we want you to do something with our response. That's where your next grant, that's where your next FTE is. Come on. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to point that out. But you're absolutely right, Dr. Alexander. And um, I'm a let Please somebody... call me Leah. My name is Leah. Listen, <laughs> listen, I'm trying to be the next doctor. Honey, when I get that, it's going to be always doctor. The, hub, the new hubby going to call me doctor, okay? Mm -hmm. The places that nobody's going to hear. But, but yes, Leah. But I, but I want us to really understand that people voices are powerful. Yeah. Not yeah. every person is going to have that courageousness. And there's nothing wrong with that. That may not be their call or their lane. Mm -hmm. So what Alberta just said, that I appreciate, but I can be there for you. And I'm more than happy. But are we really getting into the community? You know, storytelling is important. Yeah. Don't tell nobody else's story unless you have their permission. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it's important enough where if you hear a story that you can still convey their story, but not word from word because it's not your story. Yeah. So yeah. that's what I appreciate about activists and advocates that's in the field of HIV and doing community engagement. Because when we sit at these tables and want folks to hear that women and girls are suffering, mm -hmm. we can take mm -hmm. other stories with us, which is a verbal data which is your mm -hmm. verbal epidemiology to get mm -hmm. them so acquisitive to say, okay, now go collect the data. And I promise you that I'm right because I've been yeah. the one out there doing the work while you've been sitting behind a desk and a keyboard. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, That's Brady, true. you were going to say something. I'm sorry. I think I saw your hand up. Oh no. I was just honestly just like relaying on that, like not only just the grant opportunity, but also realizing like Leah and Dr. Alexander, I'm going to say it because I want people to do the same thing when I become Dr. Maiden. Listen, so, okay. Claim it, speak in it, but also like not only just leading onto the aunties, but the cousins too, recognizing yeah. that you can find like young people. I used to say the most 
impactful part of my development was having those cousin walks at Thanksgiving. That's mm. when you had the heart to hearts. That's when you had the connections. That's where we can lean on. So as we create services that lean to parents, we should also continue to have services that relate for young people learning how to not create a house for that energy, creating a house for that passion so that wherever you go, you plant it, you've created a foundation and you stand firm. You have your voice. You have your voice in spaces when it comes to engaging with healthcare providers. You have your voice and you know what your yes means. You know that especially, and we'll lean into like the next question about like prevention strategies, but like when you're engaging with the doctor, especially as a woman or a young girl talking about PrEP, if I want to get on it, I want to get on it. There's no, but there's no, what if there's no, oh, you might not be a at-risk population. There's, I want to get on it. And I want to do that for myself, my body, my sexual health, my agency. And so engaging with those aunties and cousins as we have those conversations. And like with that, I really wanted to highlight prevention. And so it was also mentioned earlier that we need to talk about what access looks like and what's available for women and girls. So how can we effectively inform women and girls about the variety of HIV prevention methods available and really emphasize the ongoing vaccine research that's aimed at broadening those prevention um, efforts for them and options? Yeah, I think something that that comes to mind and just hearing all of this dialogue and con uh, conversation is empowering, you know, our our girls, empowering women around specifically around um, HIV vaccine work. And so for the the Vanderbilt vaccine trials, we offer different trainings. We offer different opportunities for for someone to come in and learn about vaccinology and immunology to talk about um, HIV and answer any questions that they ha may have, really providing space to de debunk some of those myths and misconceptions. And, and in doing that, creating that safe space for people to have that dialogue and feel safe and feel, okay, well, I'm kind of at a place, I'm a little interested, I'm, I'm a little curious, but I kind of don't even know what yeah. I don't know. I don't know yeah. the question that I need to be asking because this is so foreign to me. And so it, it's really going to be important to um, me, you know, speaking out to our, our, our medical and research and scientist community that we have to, once, once we get the degree and we know everything, like we need to come back to community and speak in a way that, um, that, that translates. We can't Make get it so high that now we are yep. not able to, to relay the important messaging that we have. And so that's going to be a, a really big deal in, in trying to arm and empower um, women and girls. That's something that comes to mind for me. I want to just jump in real oh, quick because I'm I, Dr. Alexander. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I, this is passionate for me because I'm, you know, like a, a hood researcher, I think. Um, yeah. But it's, <laughs> it's making the research, um, you know, accessible and acceptable yep. to community. So one of the things that we do here at Meharry, which I love, is we work with like these heavy duty scientists to try to translate their, their you know, stuff into into um summaries and abstracts that community can understand and so they they give it to us and we read it and we try to put it in plain speak you know just language for regular people and then we give it back and they're like oh hell no you've ruined you know this is not what i do you've ruined my science so we have to kind of do this dance back and forth you know to highlight what you do is wonderful but you have to make it you know accessible sexy interesting you know to community if it's going to if it's going to move things along and improve people's day-to-day, -day, you know, day-to-day -day lives. So in, in some of the work that we're doing, you know, especially around PrEP, hey, it's your decision about if you want to get on PrEP, but you have to know about it first. So what we know in behavioral sciences, there's a process of making a decision. Black women aren't even to the place where you can think for yourself, is this something that I should be doing? Because you've never heard of it. Mm -hmm. You never heard of, you know, your doctors don't talk about this. They look at you, they make assumptions, you know, you ask for this stuff. Sometimes they, you know, think that it's not necessary. So we have a lot of work to do on the side of training providers and then the advocacy side, you know, how, you know, if we think about going to the doctor and being okay and knowing how to ask questions and, you know, getting what we want from our, you know, our medical visits, how do we, how do we learn how to do that? right? Did somebody teach you 
the steps of how to be an advocate when you go to the doctor, you know, we need to do more of that for everybody, really. But, you know, particularly women and girls so that they have the tools to make these decisions about what's reasonable, you know, what is reasonable for me. So, and I'm sorry to cut you off, girl. Go no, ahead. no, 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 because it flows, it, it flows to what I was going to also mention. I mentioned earlier about giving examples about seeing us in media as seeing us on the mic, you know, yeah. um, supporting um, women leadership um, in, in public health spaces, you know, all, mm -hmm. all of that. But also it, the question is almost a twofold. So, you know, my experience leading prevention programs, you know, uh, from an ASO CBO and then working up, you know, to health departments. So one of the things that I often is, why are we sending representation out into the field that does not match the priority population or the key population we're serving? And I want that to sit for a little bit because, you know, listen, prevention is 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 your entryway. I like to say sometime in public health, your prevention and outreach. So it could be a revolving door, but we have to make sure that it's so diverse mm -hmm. that if our initiative or our grant um, is to receive um, data, uh, and your money is to be spent on women and girls, have the person who is testing me talking about my sexual behaviors that I feel like I can open up to the perception of another woman. You know what I'm saying? Rather mm -hmm. than me, um, you know, go and test me, baby. Oh, baby, uh, do you do hair? No, you understand. So ambassadors is what I call them. Having the appropriate ambassadors in mm -hmm. prevention in outreach, in messaging, being the face of that leading grant that's giving you four additional employees, hire, if you wrote about women, prioritize and hire the women, you know, just, you know, do so. I think the other piece is then, then emphasizing on ongoing vac uh, vaccine research, kind of tricky a little bit. And I'm going to tell you why. I serve as the chair for um, the University of Alabama, Birmingham for their vaccine. And this is a conversation we have on key population. And Brady has been part of this conversation. And um, I can imagine, you know, over in Vanderbrick, I, I think we're all seeing this, that we're not seeing enough key population show up. But I want us to reimagine how we can get them to the table. What does our advertisement look like? Who is doing the advertisement? Does the advertisement speak to the language that is going to interrupt where I'm negotiating as a woman, me having to get up at 5.30, do breakfast, take kids to daycare, still go work nine hours, try to pick up the kids from daycare. I still haven't had lunch, got to do dinner. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. That's more from a binary. And the other piece is, is that we just negotiate a lot in society in yeah. order to survive and in order sometime to keep the family structure together. So are we really accommodating them where they're at with their busy schedule? So how do we insert some of this language in already some of the practical things that they do on a day-to-day -day basis? When was the last time we went to go recruit at a grocery store? Yes. Where the meat is on sale for $1.99 a pound. Baby, they're going to be there. You know what I'm saying? Or, or in the kids section because, um, you know, Pampers got a discount. When you buy two, you get $8 off. They going to be there. I, I, I want, you know, five and below. The girls are going to be there. Yeah. So it's it's, it's imagining yeah. about how we do our recruiting and where we're recruiting that will also be inserted in their day-to-day -day lives. You know what I'm saying? It's nothing for us to go to a fast food restaurant. Mommy, I want I want chick, uh, I want um, chicken nuggets. Well, you know they're going to go to McDonald's. And if McDonald's is lying, it's too long, they're going to run over to Wendy's. <laughs> it's a standard. Listen, I'm a parent. I'm a grandparent. I know what these kids eat, okay? And they're going to go straight there. They're going to go to the pizza place, something quick and eat. So we have to reimagine our recruitment outreach to mm -hmm. women that's going to insert and not interrupt their day-to-day, -day, but that's going to actually make their day-to-day -to, -day to feel like they're not adding anything else on their plate. The other piece, I think, is, is outside of the representation and the way we recruit, once we get them in, can we put them in leadership? Yeah. One of the things that that I am grateful for um, as a woman of trans experience and in, in, in the vaccine research world, that I was selected um, 
by some remarkable cab members, but I had the support of those researchers, those doctors who wanted to see um, a different face and a different gender and a different body mm -hmm. leading a group. Mm -hmm. And it's been remarkable um, because I'm able to sit there and be able to filter and reimagine our agenda not being so binary, but how do we open up to be very, Brandy has been there, but we, we something else, okay? I can imagine there's others as well, you know, um, there, I'm sure there is, but that is an honor. So when they do come, don't make them domestic support. Mm. Yes. Put them in leadership. Yeah. Find ways where their voices can be amplified. Put them on your commercials and your PowerPoints. Um, let them see themselves reflected. And then the final piece is, is that we um, still, especially in the Black Southern community, we still have stigma around um, vaccines. We understand the history of it, the Tuskegee, all of that. So how do, so who are the key players? It's almost, I work in policy and legislation and still do HIV, um, you know, and prevention and education and all of that. But I can imagine if I can get with the power voices who changes the, tra the trajectory of women and girls and vaccination, what does it look like for me to go to First Baptist of whomever city and say, we would like to do a presentation at your church, or can we meet with you? And I want you to be able to take what you find so inspiring and add it to your sermon. Mm -hmm. And then let them know that we will be in the vest of you in the foyer to meet anyone to let them know. So we have to, in, in essence, we have to start doing this work non-conventional and non-traditional. Mm -hmm. There is still a professional way we can do it, but if we continue to do it the same way, we're going to continue receiving the same data. We're going to continue having the same conversation. But if we do it in a non-conventional and a non-traditional way, my last job in, as an Uncle Sam employee in public was research. Mm -hmm. The best position I've ever think I've had before I moved over to policy and legislation, because it taught me that I got to go out into the world and take yeah. their language and build the 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 grant the initiative that's going to speak to them for them to buy into it to even say I even heard you and I think that it's a two phone so I think that if we if we reimagine we can start seeing our numbers for women and girls um um a legal age girls um I must say because it's vac vaccine you got to sign off um and other party and key populations in vaccination but we got to have those ambassadors in place um because that's a form of empathy. As a form of perception of empathy, if I show up to Brady, I know that we're gonna have a woman conversation, and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be fine. I, I was watching Mad TV. I, listen, it was just old school. It was just on TV, <laughs> and um, the woman went to a gynecologist, and she said, "Oh," and it was a funny skit, but she, but it was relevant. Oh, I've always had a female gynecologist. I'm I'm uncomfortable by you being a male, and guess what? He tried to convince her. Oh, I'm fine. You'll be comfortable with me and blah, blah, blah. No, we can't do that. Can't do that. I, well, one of the, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Well, one of the things I was saying was about doing, being an ambassador. I actually have uh, how I started within the Vanderbilt vaccine uh, on the community cap. I was actually a participant in, in the research uh, in 1998. So a lot of times when I go out and speak, when people hear that, especially Black people, and they were like, wait a minute, how long ago was this? I was like 25 years ago. And I also have this, which is vaccine-induced cell positivity. So I'm going to make this as quick as possible. The, uh, the experimental product that they gave me, it produces so many antibodies. The antibodies, of course, it wasn't real HIV, but the antibodies look like the HIV antibody. And that is still 25 years later floating around, that antibody is still floating around in my blood, which is not dissimilar to chickenpox antibodies or measles antibodies. We have, And every time you ever got sick, antibodies. So it's just one of probably thousands of different antibodies or hundreds of thousands of different antibodies running around in my blood. But I inform people of this. And when they hear about you know, it hasn't changed my life. My life has still been the same. I've traveled. I've gone to the doctor. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't alter anything major in my life. Only thing I cannot do is give blood. 
which I was anemic, so I couldn't get blood anyway. So, but it's that's one of the things is to to I use my experience of being there, and I can literally when I tell people that I was um, a trial participant, I can see a little thing go off, and then I get additional questions, and I get this, and I get that, and also researchers ask questions. Well. Okay, well, you were doing this, and because you have this, because there's not too many people who are still involved uh, in, you know, doing uh, volunteering uh, among the HBTN that has this. So I get some researchers asking me questions, you know, about, you know, coming in to check the steel, see if I have this, what is that like, and different things like that. So a lot of it is um, some of the people who, are able to speak out, you know, we do speak out and we do say that and we do continue to volunteer. I want to kind of mention something as well. I really appreciate it with um, what was mentioned earlier in terms of not interrupting the day to day. And Marion, let me get you. Sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I felt it. <laughs> It's Marion, car in front of it, Carmarion. I got it. I love it. Carmarion <laughs> had a beautiful point earlier in terms of um, not interrupting the day-to-day. -day. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we need to be really intentional about when we're reaching out to communities. This is a partnership. This is not a take-take-take yes. a, a scenario. Mm -hmm. It is a partnership at the end of the day. And so you know, as organizations and institutions, if and in trying to do the work and trying to facilitate it, we need to move away from an ask and promote an offering because um, people need help. And as much as people love to be altruistic, we're also living in an age where people are anti exploitation. And so we need to be. Uh, and more intentional about what it is that we're offering, what it is, uh, whether it's right now in, in, in live time or if it is uh, or what the other benefits may be. And so I think it's just an, it's going to be in a significant portion to to servicing women and girls. I think Carmarian had several different points to offer when talking about, you know, how can we be supportive? How, that means getting our voices, not just in the room and a seat at the table, but we need to be paid. <laughs> we need to be paid for our efforts because our perspectives matter. And it's not enough just to say, oh, well, you'll receive, you know, awareness or uh, you'll no, be we want highlighted. All yes. We want all free. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. On the way, yeah. Yeah. I do want to, I just want to just say, you said move from the acts to an offering. I just want to keep repeating that because yes. I think that's a very powerful statement um, for our audience. Um, even in the line of work that you do, if you're doing any type of community engagement outreach, is, is that we do have to remove from always asking, what are we offering? Yeah. Because then it feel like tokenization. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And to pivot that just a little bit, I, I kind of want to offer this question um, to the group in terms of HIV prevention. What school, what role should or could schools and uh, educational institutions serve in this HIV prevention work and strategy when it comes to our women and girls? Yeah, so I would, uh, I'll start with that. I would say schools and organizations could offer after school clubs to have conversations. I think one of the most impactful thing when I was growing up and even some of the work I see now is having that after school session where you could talk about the stuff that mattered, where you could talk about your sexual health and what that meant and what that looked like. Do you use contraception? What does that look like? How does it look to engage asking a potential partner? If you can't, do you know how to put it on? Like having those, I would say direct questions and having that space where you feel safe and brave enough to speak out about their stories and what's going on in their lives and having the school like facilitate and just organize just the space and creating the container but allowing youth to have those conversations is how I think schools and organizations can step in like making sure that you're adding prevention as a part of your conversation like your students should be set up for success in all areas of their life, not just academia and what that means. Because once they leave campus, they're a whole person that has a whole life mm -hmm. that be out here and doing things. And I wish, I wish at 16, 
somebody would have told me and explained to me what that looks like outside of a school setting. I mean, the schools ought to do something because most of the garbage that our kids, you know, encounter starts at school. My kids have, you know, had access to foolishness and just, you know, it's so much garbage coming at them that it would be nice, you know, if our schools could be that safe place, you know, where you're kind of um, have strategies to combat all of this, you know, negative um, sort of erroneous information that they're getting. I think the problem with us in the South is, you know, we have so many limitations on, on you know, what's appropriate for schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, parents want to have those conversations, but parents sometimes don't do the best job of it either. So, um, you know, I think that's great. But so, but then you, for me, I think about outside of school, you know, so, um, you know, I'm part of a organization and my, you know, kids are in a group. So they, you know, get the kids together and put the parents out of the room. And so first I was like, no, what are you going to be talking about my kid? You know, that I can't be in the room. What is going on? But then I said, you know what? I'm getting hung up on stuff that doesn't matter. I trust these adults and I need my children to have a safe space to hear this stuff from somebody that they will listen to and receive it. And so let me take my feelings or whatever I'm feeling as a you know parent feeling left out of this or whatever. Um, and, you know, trust these people that I have a relationship with to stand in the gap for me to mm -hmm. make sure that my students I mean, you know, that my my kids know what's happening and, you know, what's out here for them in the real world, because it's not like, I mean, I'm old. It's not, you know, I thank God in heaven that we didn't have cameras and videos and all. I mean, you know, ain't nobody got no proof about me because it couldn't be recorded. <laughs> I don't think, look, I don't want to speak too early, too soon, but, you know, it's just a different world. It's a different world, you know, so we need people to stand in the gap for us sometimes when, you know, all parents want the best for their kids, but sometimes it just has to be somebody else to stand in the gap for us. Yes, and just because this is near to dear to my heart, I'm going to say one more thing and then I'm going to open it back up to the group, but also like Carmarian mentioned earlier about the messenger. So also having schools recognize that you can create the space, and I say after school, because we do recognize that in the South, sexual education courses are a hot topic issue, and the information that our students are getting is very, I would say, cis, binary, very much like that approach. And so having maybe that cousin moment or that auntie moment after school, having, using your phone to open up a chat for folks to like be able to text into and ask the questions on hey, what do I do if a photo gets leaked? How do I navigate these spaces? How do I navigate, you know, the recording and all those efforts that come into the fact that we live in such a digital age mm -hmm. where youth probably interact a lot on their phones and online more than they do, you know, in person at times. So yep. having that space to recognize how do you navigate that um, from the cousins, I would say that cousin moment um, in those spaces would be beneficial as well. Alberta, let me let you go, um, <clears throat> if you don't mind, and then I'll go after you, because you, you've been going last, and I, yeah, let me, let me swap with you, if you don't mind. Thank you so much. I was just, well, you, what y'all would talk about, it took me back when I was in high school, I went to an inner city school, and this is before they, I mean, we were still restrictive what they told us about sex ed, but there was actually, uh, someone got a grant, a organization actually got a grant. And I can't remember what the name of the group was, but she was actually, it was like, it was, if you were a junior or senior, it was, could be one of your free periods, you could go there and it was just, it was a leadership program. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, we end up talking about random things because she was actually a corporate person who decided, you know, she wanted to leave corporate life and, you know, go in and give, um, 
the inner city youth something that she didn't have, which was like a mentor or someone to talk to or a way to become a leader. So we did that program for a while. But again, we ended up talking about multiple different things while we were in there. And I mean, there's different ways that we can do stuff. And then there was also after school programs, as they were saying, that we also did stuff. I mean, I think a lot of it is there are ways that people can do stuff and it would really be nice if some of those programs came back, if we could find some grants or something like that for some of these programs to come back where mm -hmm. it can be a group setting where these people can do this. So, um, <laughs> cause I don't want nobody to think I'm calling anybody out. You understand? I just, mm, okay. So we're talking about youth engagement. And I, and, I, and I do co-sign with all of my other panelists, but the reality is, is that sex education are being removed every day from, yeah. from school systems, okay? Yeah. So we no longer can really rely on school yeah. um, districts because if they're taking out DEI and B stuff, they're taking out sex ed and only yeah. want to teach that the appropriate yeah. sex ed is abstinence. OK, mm -hmm. when we think about youth organizations, OK, the majority of the youth organizations that we have now that's been grant funded are our LGBTQ plus youth center. So that means that that we need some more diversity in youth engagement in organizations. Mm -hmm. So I really want to talk about um, some things. So since we don't have sex ed generally in K through 12, um, we have not lost a fight in higher education, mm -hmm. okay? If we're going to look at the data, our epidemiology data, we know that it is affecting the race of Black populations and then Brown populations. Mm -hmm. So at HRC or the Human Rights Campaign, we have an initiative, and I encourage others to jump on the bandwagon because we can't do everything. We, we just mm -hmm. really can't. Our dollars only go so far. Uh, but we, if we target our historic Black colleges and universities, yeah. They got younger siblings. Mm -hmm. They got parents that they can speak to. Listen, when you go to an HBCU school, and I and I, who gonna give me a scholarship to HBCU? Say I'm gonna make. Say I'm putting this on record, y'all, uh, because one of the things I know about HBCU uh, in my time of working in higher ed, the moment that they hit that door, them schools are teaching them how to be mature. Yeah, uh, as they like to say, young men and young women. Mm -hmm. So their way of communicating, even back to their parents, is so much appreciative because so they can complete sentences now. Mm -hmm. You know, they can, you know, they can do all of that. And that's not to be offensive. But if we focus on higher education, um, because the data is showing us that there is a spike. So I know we're starting at 13 in some areas. It's much lower. But, mm -hmm. you know, 13, you know, we're going all the way up to 24. If we can get them in a higher institution now. You know, I'm from the old school where I remember, and I hope we can bring this back. If we rely on public and private and charter schools, we are going to see the numbers increase for our youth because they're not talking about it. If anything, what's passing um, those youth is their phones and their level in sexual engagement. So I remember what happened to the municipal recreational centers. They used to help raise us. They used to bring programs in. Where are my municipal rec, rec centers? Why can't we continue bringing in education components, especially in the summertime, where these parents want their youth occupied and not get in trouble? What about um, churches, where churches used to be the responsibility and the meeting place for so much in our communities? Um, so, and then what about those leadership organizations that's focusing on girls? Okay. Those leadership, those, I like to call those quote unquote, Michelle Obama leadership academies types. Are we really talking about, uh, you know, sexual health and sex positive information? Because a lot of us, it's almost like when we, I, you know, when, when you hear people say, I went to seminary and they broke everything that I thought I once believed just to, for me to rebuild. What's well, the same concept? What are we doing to help break down what was taught to us and really open the book for ourselves and get another interpretation that's relevant for our lives? And then the other piece, this is another uh, opportunity for a grant. 
because I like to give tools, okay? Another opportunity for grant. When we speak about youth engagement, every time you look up, I don't care if it's in a movie, if you're going to the grocery store, if you're going to school, they have their phones. Where are my people who are getting grant money under technology that can build an app to have conversations with our youth? to push out education and build a brave and safe space where if they have a question about something as it relates to their health, whether that's HIV, gonorrhea, chlamydia, mm -hmm. there is money available. All you have to do is build it out and manage it and have somebody that's readily available. And in HIV testing, they have, um, there's a word I just, emancipation at a certain age yep. where they don't need their parents' consent where you can either go to them and they come to you to test them. Mm -hmm. There's all types of creative things that can we can do. So while the lawmakers are trying to um, take sex ed out, we have a responsibility in other institutions and yeah. other C3 areas where we can actually incorporate mm -hmm. and make a huge difference. And it can be a cultural thing because in school, it's not always cultural. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's all I had. You um, know, one, one other thing real quick that the schools could do, and it's particularly for women and girls, is get more um, uh, girls and young women interested in STEAM, science, technology, you know, engineering, art, math. That's good. Um, you know, because we need more women who will eventually have careers in you know infectious disease hiv prevention mm -hmm. you know those those types of fields and it starts with science technology you know science technology art being creative thinking about creative you know health communication strategies to reach uh populations like us that are you know oftentimes um undervalued and overlooked so you know, school, yeah, I mean, schools, especially schools in the South, they ain't gonna, they ain't gonna do the sex talk all that good. But, you know, encouraging more young girls to go into um, science, technology, math, you know, engineering kind of fields mm -hmm. is, is one sort of, you know, place that where they could really do more and be successful. So. Yes, and with that, um, you all dropped some nuggets, some bombs, some truths. There were sermon moments, like I was bouncing all over the place. And I really just want to like close this out by highlighting a lot of the points that came across to make sure that women and girls across the diaspora are here and we want to be represented. So pass the mic, run the check, change the location and how you adapt to us, rely on the aunties, hit up the cousins, Put us in STEM, increase the funding, like meet us where we are because we're here. We want the space mm -hmm. and we are powerful beings and we want to be centered in research. We want to be represented in prevention methods. We're here and we're here to stay. And I just want to end with that and just say thank you all for your time. Thank you all for this conversation. It was tea. It was steaming. We love it. I will <laughs> felt folks got what they needed. If they don't, feel free to reach out. And I really wanted to open up just as a last closeout, if there's any programs, if there's any opportunities or events, because I never want us to leave a space and not have another place for folks to go get what they need. And so if there's anything that you wanted to highlight and raise up for the community to hear and engage in going forward, please, this is your time to do so. Yeah, I, I just want to, oh, go ahead. Kamari, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. Is it me nope. now? It's Mine's you, is really girl. Short. It's you. It's okay, you. Mine's is really short. Um, work for the Human Rights Campaign. So I will say visit us at hrc.org. Uh, forward slash um, HIV and health equity. One of our roles at our national office, um, there's still education that's needed in an inclusive way. Um, there are some initiatives um, out of our DC office that is um, certainly available for anyone um, that's available. So I would say go to the website, get familiar what we're able to offer this, these resources and tools are free of charge. Um, the second piece is, is um, really for the audience, um, if there are events like we're having, I'm going to ask, use the power of your social media to share, 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 not just what you heard from here, but the more that we give amens and visibility to this topic of women and girls, the nation gets to become educated about who we are because the uh, algorithm will then 
for social media to put us at the top. You get what I'm saying? So that's going to be my ask to the listeners is, is blow us up, um, blow this webinar up if you don't have any other local events, but blow us up, blow us women up so the algorithm can have us for the remaining of that week at the top. So our voices will be heard, be taken serious. And someone will then give us some money to actually do this work in a very, 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 very um, unanimous and unity way. I, look, I just want to say some names of some of my colleagues and sisters, uh, names people can Google. So Dr. Tai Link, is doing amazing work in HIV prevention. Um, my Spellman sister, Miranda Ward, is doing wonderful work in HIV prevention. She has um, designed an intervention for doctors that combines the conversation about HIV testing and COVID testing. So like, you know, check out her. And then I have a, a sister friend and colleague, Cynthia Harris, who is doing amazing thing with art. And so sharing, you know, stories of folks who have been working in HIV prevention. She's done a wonderful choreo poem um, here in Nashville, you know, starting with the lived experience of a young um, Black woman here in Nashville that had HIV. And so her work, her work is amazing. So um, I'm so thankful to them and they kind of keep me going. And, you know, we're, we're thinking and strategizing and, you know, thinking about ways to really begin to make even more of a difference um, with HIV in the South. So uh, Google my girls, Google my girls, because you won't be sorry. <laughs> yes, and I would say for the Southern AIDS Coalition, please reach out to us. Please follow us on social media. Also, we are continuing to do more community science programming, um, also with the Vaccine Social Media Ambassador Program. And so that program really recruits content creators and influencers to learn this information, study up so you can create content that is adaptable to community and for them to be receptive and receive it. So please stay uh, tuned for more of that information. We're trying to put them in STEM and we're trying to make them an influencer. So yes. Um, that would be a really great way to engage with the Southern AIDS Coalition. And I would say go to hvtn.org and you can find out more about vaccines. Um, you can also find ways that you can volunteer. Um, we have community advisory board. The HVTN is nationwide, actually worldwide. Uh, you can find where you can volunteer. A lot of places have different ways for you to volunteer. Yes, and Alberta, you reminded me of one great point. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Red Ribbon Registry that is created by the HIV Vaccine Trials Network. That is a link that'll take you to any ongoing clinical trial research in your area. So please, we will drop that link in the comments section as well for you all to engage with. But if you are interested in continuing and wanting to continue your participation in research, please check that um, out. And with that, Carmarian, Dr. Alexander, Alberta, and Jarissa. It was a pleasure to engage with y'all. The tea was steaming. I love being in community. And I just want to say thank you all for your time. And thank you everyone for watching. You all have a great one.